Well, when we all, when we all get, to heaven, get to heaven, what a day what of a rejoicing day that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful. Trusting, serving, trusting, serving, serving every day. Just one glimpse in me. You may be seated. I'm telling you, that's good singing. My, 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 my. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We're so happy you're here today. And if you, I started to say if you wandered in off the street, but <laughs> I want to tell you, I congratulate the vision of the city fathers of Wichita, Kansas, to build this thing out here. The city will catch up with it after a while. <laughs> but if you came in somewhere and you don't know where you are and you've looked around wondering what in the world this is, it's an old-fashioned, heartfelt, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent, devil-chasing, sin-killing, true, blue, red, hot, blood-bought, God-given, Jesus-loving camp meeting. <laughs> Take your way back tonight, listen to the song.
Like a little baby when it cries for its mother Like a child I was helpless alone Then I met the master Now I am one of his own For all things were changed When he found me A new day broke through Oh, all around me For I met the Master Now I belong to Him Like a blind man who walks in the darkness I had longed, I had searched for the light Hallelujah Then I met the Master Now I walk no more in the night For all things were changed when he found me When he found me A new day broke through Well, all around The master Now I Belong To him Now I Belong To Him For spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty above that fruited plain.
my good and brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Praise the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Thank you so very much. To me, the greatest thing in the world is when a soul gets saved. There's nothing quite like it. And I can almost feel and sense the joy in heaven when it takes place. I can just hear the Father say, set another place at the table. <laughs> For that one that's missing is coming home. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Sloan. In heaven they just received a reservation From a missionary in a different land To accommodate a party of believers Who have just accepted God's salvation plan And as the angel says now all is ready God hears the cry from another man who has just accepted God as his salvation to dine in the presence of this man. So set another place at the table. You got to write another name on the road. Take out another road and shine up one more crown. For this child is heaven bound. Then add another course to that song As the angels rehearse the welcome song Set another place at the table For the rest of the family's coming home If you've not accepted the invitation It's designed forever in His hands and there is a promise to the believer We'll dine in the presence of this man So set another place at the table You've got to write another name on the road Take out another road and shine up one more crown For this child is heaven bound then add another verse to that chorus As the angels rehearse the welcome song Set another place at the table For the rest of the family's coming home Well, set another place at the table You've got to write another name on the road Take out another road and shine up one more crown Sing it, Thomas For this child is heaven bound Then add another verse to that chorus As the angels rehearse the welcome song Set another place at the table For the rest of the family's coming home Set another place at the table for the rest of the family's coming home They're coming home Well, hallelujah, glory Sing that last chorus again, come on Praise the Lord Set another place at the table You've got to write another name on the road Take out another road And shine up one more crown For this child is heaven bound Then add another verse to that chorus As the angels rehearse the welcome song Set another place at the table for the rest of the family's coming home Set another place at the table You've got to write another name on the road Take out another road And shine up one more crown For this child is heaven bound Then add another verse to that chorus 
as the angels rehearse the welcome song. Set another place at the table for the rest of the families coming home. Set another place at the table for the rest of the families coming home. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In South Africa just a few months ago, this song, I heard it the first time, and I think it will bless your heart. Listen to it. Precious spirit. 
my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control, take control. of every situation that has troubled my mind. Troubled me. Oh, my cares and burdens on to you. Out of the great old-fashioned camp meetings, Methodist camp meetings of nearly a century ago, came a song that has touched a lot of people. And it's the old-fashioned camp meeting variety. I will admit, probably, we've changed it a tiny bit from those Methodist days, but maybe not. I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, John Starnes, Royal Telephone. Give me Jesus on the line. Well, glory. You know she always got her call <laughs> Operator Information Oh, give me Jesus Give me Jesus Tell us about Jesus Give me the King of Kings. Oh, give me my longtime friend. Give me Jesus on the line. Intro's never busy. You see, it's always on the line. And you can hear from heaven, oh, just about any old time. Tis a royal service that is free for one and all. Now, when you get in trouble, you give this royal line a call. You see, it's hell up on the glory. Oh, what joy divine. Telephone, it's free. free. It was built for service, Lord, just for you and me. Now there will be no waiting on this royal line. Telephone and glory, you see, it's always just in time. Telephone and telephone and glory, oh, what 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Central's never busy, always on the line. You can hear from heaven just about any old time. Built by God the Father, for as one and all, you can talk to Jesus on that royal telephone. Hallelujah. I know the world thinks we're crazy. Well, they only think we are. We know they are. <laughs> One day we will behold the King, the wonderful, glorious Christ of glory. Ladies and gentlemen, Janet Pascal. Yeah. 
shall behold the King. Praise the holy name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles tonight, please turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation 16, starting with verse 12, going down through the 16th verse. John, as he writes on the Isle of Patmos, given a kaleidoscopic view of coming world events even into the eternal ages, writes and says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. I want to use for a subject tonight, he gathered them together, Armageddon. Would you bow your heads? Father, I ask in the holy name of Jesus that your presence would move within and upon us, that we may speak these words that we believe you have given unto us. We're totally dependent upon thee. And I marvel that you would entrust this great power and frail earthen vessels. But, O oh God, I would ask that your Spirit would aid and abet us to do that which we must do tonight and say that which we must say. And when it's said, it will be as Paul said, it is not of us, but of God. And I would ask it all in the great name of Jesus, and everyone said amen and amen. Some time ago, I was asked to speak to a gathering of ministers in Washington, D.C. The most influential pastors of several major denominations in the United States, pastoring the largest churches in the world. And just a few hours before, several of us preachers had met with the President of the United States for a short period of time. And I had sought God asking His guidance and direction respecting that which He would want me to give to these ministers. And God, I believe, spoke two things to my heart which I will very briefly relate to you as I related it to them. I believe that God told me to tell them that particular morning that the sins of the United States of America are so gross, so wicked, so multitudinous, so evil, of such magnitude, especially when you consider the light that this nation has known, the light of the gospel, that whatever we endeavor to do will not avoid judgment, it will only delay it. Secondly, that if God does delay judgment, that He is bringing together politically, geopolitically, economically, and above all spiritually, a tremendous array of forces planned in heaven 
for the last thrust over this world to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of the earth. If that delay comes, this will be the purpose for and of that delay, that this gospel may be preached to the whole world for a witness, and then shall the end come. A short time ago, Leonid Brezhnev, leader of many years of the Soviet Union, died. When he died, as they laid his body in a casket in the Kremlin, the bottom of the casket broke and his body fell onto the floor. Most that were there hated him so much that there was no care or concern about the remains and when they carried him to the crypt, and I saw this by television, and they were to let the casket down into the crypt, it slipped, fell, and turned end over end. The Soviet Union leader of monolithic communism is in a state of disarray today, possibly more dangerous than she's ever been in her sordid evil history. The world is actually divided into two camps. As far as God, I think, is concerned, those two camps are Christianity and communism. The two mightiest forces on the face of the earth, one the representative of Christ, the other the representative of the evil one, Satan. As I stand here tonight, high-level talks are being urged all over this nation by politicians, by ambassadors, by strategists that the head of this nation, the president, and the head of the Soviet Union must sit down to a table and discuss the problems at hand. I may be a voice crying in the wilderness, and possibly my statements are lampooned, laughed at, but I'm right. It's a waste of time to sit down with pathological liars. Amen. To endeavor to come to some type of conclusion. You see, peace to the communist mind means the absence of any opposition of threat to communism. The communist detente is not an alternative to war, but an essential preparation for war. The Soviet history of broken treaties and agreements affirms this philosophy. The communist mind coexistence means to live together on communist terms. Actually, coexistence, so-called, is used as a weapon by the communist. Non-interference means that no one is supposed to interfere with communism while communism is interfering in the affairs of other states to foster its own selfish ambitions. You see, communism does not work by itself. It's a bankrupt society, if one would call it a society, headed up by thugs. When I say communism, I'm not speaking of the Russian people, I'm speaking of the gangsters that head up this evil empire. It does not work by itself, it cannot work by itself, it has to be supported by aggression and force or else it will die. And This force includes terror, blackmail, torture and murder, individual and mass. It hates its ambitions and fears are exploited for the good of the party. The American people do not really understand communism. 
Communism is the extirpation of all religious beliefs and human freedoms which have been developed through several thousand years of painful struggle. Communism is the total abolition of all private property except for a minimum of personal belongings. Communism means the total destruction of all previously accepted social and political standards, guides, and morals. Communism means the abolition of human dignity. It means absolute degradation. In brief, communism is death. Let us remember that this evil of communism is not what it says it is, but an embodiment of what under any ethics must be termed absolute evil. It has proved a means by which few men can own a nation and everyone in it, their minds as well as their bodies. And as far as these Soviet leaders are concerned, man has no soul. Now, briefly, let me give you an objective of communism. It intends to destroy civilization as we know it and to replace it with a planned existence from which will emerge a new Soviet man completely responsive and subservient to the masters of the universal communist state. Communism involves an attempt to make the world over in a hundred percent different form. It aims at taking away from man more than his private property. It wants to rob you of your God-given nobility. You see, communism is an uncontestable fact that our country, the USA, the symbol of the free world, is the ultimate priceless goal of international communism. The leaders of international communism have vowed to achieve world domination. And this cannot happen until the red flag is flown over the United States of America. That is their intention. The people in the United States and Canada basically are isolated. Our people actually do not know what is going on in the world. We do not understand basically what's taking place. Most of the world is fertile ground for the lies of communism and for the enslavement of the masses. And for the last 50 years, 6,000 free men a day have been enslaved in the web of communism. Think about that. Just a short time ago, we were in the country of Swaziland in Southern Africa. Right next door to Swaziland is Mozambique. Mozambique tonight is starving to death. It's a communist state. Thousands upon thousands of black-skinned natives, little children, their hair falling out, turning iron, stomach swollen and bloated walking and filling the dusty roads, not knowing where they're going until the child finally dies of acute starvation, not isolated cases, but thousands upon thousands upon thousands. They tell us the possibility exists by the year 2000 that 100 million Africans could die of acute starvation. They tell us of those 100 million Africans that could die, 50 million of them will be children on the continent of Africa. No one knows what to do. The sad fact about it is Central America is not very far behind. Central America today that we wish we could sweep under the rug, we wish that it did not crowd us but yet it beats upon our door. And the situation looks like it has no answer to it. I was in Washington a short time ago for a high-level briefing on Central America, and no one had the answer. A few days later, Rios Mott, the former president of Guatemala, 
was with me on our telecast, a man, as far as I know, the only saved Holy Ghost-filled man that ever served as the head of state. I asked him, Mr. Mont, why? How were you overthrown? Why? He shook his head and said, I really do not know. Maybe the only man that had the answer, that question was posed to one of the president's cabinet officers. Why didn't the American State Department try to help the man? There was no answer. It would seem tonight that the world is heading pell-mell towards something. Every single minute that goes by, one million dollars, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year, is being spent on armaments. Think of that. Every hour, 60 million dollars spent on weapons. Nearly one half trillion dollars a year. The treasure of the world, the wealth of the nations, the sweat of the brow of the hundreds of millions going for weapons. Today, more so than ever before, the threat, the pull, the specter of Armageddon looms over the horizon. Our leaders do not have the answer. The world speeds toward it. And I know I stand here tonight sounding like a preacher of gloom, but I have to preach the truth. I wish I could stand here and tell you that there will be solutions to these problems, that there will be answers, but there are no solutions and there will be no answers. I wish I could say that the brightest minds in the world can somehow find a way to usher us into a utopian paradise, but it's not in the cards, mister. I wish I could say that our children have a future in this nation, but I'm concerned that there aren't or isn't much future for any children in any nation of the world. Let me give you just a little tiny kaleidoscope of events that's going to take place according to the Word of God. You see, of all the thinkers and all the philosophers and all of the educators and all the geniuses and all of the Harvard and the Yale and the Princeton and the Cambridge graduates, none know. They grope. They live in utter hopelessness. There is no future, they say. And I'll admit outside of God there isn't. As far as man's effort is concerned, there is no future. But there is a God, and this is His Word, and it will stand, and it will never die. And I want to make a statement. God owns this world. He owns it. He made it. He made it a long, long time ago. He breathed breath of life into man. God is the author of this world, not of its evil, not of its wickedness, not of its sin, not of its obscenity. God owns it, though He made it, and He's coming back to claim it very, very soon. The next great event on the horizon of time that the world is ill-prepared for, and most of the church knows nothing about it, is the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Newsmen watching this telecast smirk and laugh your sardonic laugh if you want to when I tell you that soon there 
there is going to be a trump that's going to sound and drivers are going to instantly leave out of automobiles and pilots are going to leave out of airplanes and wives are going to leave in front of their kitchen sinks and little children are going to leave out of school rooms and the graves are going to be opened and the sainted dead is coming forth and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Call me cracked if you want to. Call me a preacher of wistful thinking. Say I'm speaking through my head. Write your little pitiful prose. And brother, when the rain falls on it and it crumbles into dust, this will still be here. And it still says, Jesus Christ is coming again. <laughs> Glory. We ought to teach it in our colleges. We ought to teach it in our schools. We ought to shout it from behind our pulpits. We ought to sing it in our choirs. We ought to tell our children. We ought to tell our parents. We ought to tell the heathen that he is coming. He is coming to take himself a bride. He is coming to take himself a people that he died for on a cross called Calvary. The rapture of the church. I realize tonight there's argument, dissension, discussion over this in the body of Christ. Some Christians, as I hurriedly throw this in, can't figure out whether they're staying or going. <laughs> some just in case are buying dried beans and storing them in some old underground cavern somewhere. Some seem to desire to go through the great tribulation. Protestants leave that to the Catholics. They're better at purgatory than we are. But I like the way my Church of God friends put it. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm getting ready for things of pearl. Keeping my record right, watching both day and night. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the uptaker. I'm not looking for some missile. I'm looking for the coming King, Jesus Christ, to gather us and take us away. Rapture, rapture, rapture. Hallelujah. Do you really believe that, Jimmy Swaggart? I really believe it, sir. I believe it. <laughs> Hallelujah. After the rapture, the world will be plunged into great tribulation. It will be a time that will be so horrible and so hideous that words cannot describe it. That's what I meant a while ago when I said I cannot look and see a good future in the immediate just ahead. Jesus called it great tribulation, such as the world has never seen before and will never see again in all of its history or future. A time of such agony, a time of such horrifying hell that will burst in cataclysmic destruction and God takes his people away because he hath not appointed us us under wrath and for the first time in the day of grace he pulls off the gloves we wonder why he doesn't do something I have seen too many starving children. I've seen too many bloated bellies. I've seen too many little boys and girls' hair turn orange because of a lack of something to eat. I've seen too many that I've held in my arms in Africa and other places of the world that I knew they were dying and I knew they could not live and I knew they were starving. I've seen too many. I've seen too much and something down inside of me. I get sick inside 
sick of despotic uh, rulers that care not for mankind and spread their gloom and destruction and death uh, over their countries and nation and cause so much pain that it beggars description. I'm sick of that. I'm tired of it. I want to cry inside, Heavenly Father, I know you're a God of love, but do something about it. Do something about it, God. Do something about most of the world that's hungry, most of the world that, that hurts, most of the world that's sad. Do something about it. And God hates the evil a million times more than Jimmy Swaggart ever could, or you ever could. And during this time, God is going to pour out destruction upon this planet, upon evil and upon sin and upon wickedness and upon evildoers, such as our minds cannot imagine, contemplate, or comprehend. It will be called the time of Jacob's trouble. It will affect the whole world, but it will basically affect Israel more than it affects anyone else. Now, Israel, the people that will not go away. Satan declared war on that tiny people 4,000 years ago. Starting with Egypt, drowning the boy babies, going on over into the Assyrian Empire with the might of Nineveh at its head, then mighty Babylon persecuting Israel, strangling it to death, then Medo-Persia, then Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire, and then mighty Rome. I was on Masada not long ago, and as I stood there looking out over the Dead Sea, standing on that place where, where many, many hundreds of Jewish people took their own lives rather than surrender to Field Commander Silva. His fortifications are still there, 2,000 years old. Roman sweat built the ramp to the top of Masada. A Jewish guide was standing by me, and the Spirit of God began to move through me as I started to speak to that television camera before me. I looked about, where is the mighty Roman Empire, the great Roman Eagle, where is she at today? Her Caesars are organ grinders, her generals are peanut vendors. Nothing left but a memory of bygone days. The might and the majesty and the power of Rome, I'm trying to tell you something, America. Gone, but that star of David still flies. The star of David still flies in the coming maelstrom that lies ahead, in the coming judgment that's going to burst in cyclonic fury over this world and this planet. America's only hope. Listen to me, White House. Listen to me, State Department. Listen to me, Pentagon. Listen to me, Mr. President. America's only hope is not GNP. It's not scientific achievement. It's not an education or Harvard or Yale. But it's America holding to that little tiny state of Israel and saying, we will stand with you because God said, they that bless Israel, I will bless. And they that curse Israel, Israel, I will curse. When you hear names like Buchenwald, Auschwitz, Treblinka, something inside squeezes because six million Jews burned to death and gassed to death and over a million of them little children. And that madman Hitler's demonic quest for world domination. Don't ever go against God. When you go against God, you can't win. I don't care how mighty America is. When America goes against God, America cannot win. 
Don't go against God. Israel has sinned, but God still has his hand on her. The whole world is pointing toward one cataclysmic climax, and it's called Armageddon. It's rushing pell-mell toward it. No minds, no brilliance, no intelligence, no ingenuity can stop it. It's going toward Armageddon because this book says he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. Armageddon, Megiddo, the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jezreel. The Russian bear poises north. And we wonder when Russia will come down. Russia is already there. She's there with her cat's paw, Syria. I stood on the top of the command post in Beirut in the Peace for Galilee campaign with the commander-in-chief of Israel's army in Lebanon. And he said, the PLO will go one way or the other, they will go. But a few weeks later, as I watched that day and the next day, hundreds of United States made Mack trucks, international trucks, hauling hundreds of burned out Russian tanks back to Israel. The very best built, the latest models in the Soviet Union, blasted by Israeli cannon. I sat in a command car as 105 millimeter howitzers, weapons, and uh, shells seemed like a freight train screaming over our head, going into PLO positions. But a few days later, the United States put a hand on that commando in chief and told Israel to stop. And Israel stopped. Russia was thrilled that Israel stopped. And today, America's paying the price for it. 200 odd boys died in Lebanon because of America's decision. This little tiny nation today is being boxed into a corner. I asked an ambassador from Israel not long ago as we were riding alone by the Mediterranean going to Caesarea, uh, where old Caesarea was. I asked him, I said, do you know the future of your country? That little tiny piece of, of real estate that is hardly bigger than a section of land here in Kansas, and yet it's the focal point of the whole world. There is a tremendous battle going on today in Congress whether to, to place America's position behind Israel's determination to make Jerusalem her capital instead of Tel Aviv. I was asked the other day to testify before Congress respecting this. And America vacillates scared of Arab oil. Israel's inflation rate today is toward 400%. And still she fights to try to settle the West Bank. And keep your eye on that little country because she's the signpost. She's the hands on the clock. What's going to happen to her? Israel's problems as she speeds toward the battle of Armageddon is not going to be solved. They're going to get worse and worse. In the not too distant future, a man is going to arise. He will be a man such as the world has never seen. He will have the military prowess of Alexander the Great. He will have the strength of a Roman Caesar. This man will capture the attention and the, 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 
the astonishment of the whole world. He will be called the Antichrist. Not by the world, but it's called that in the Bible. He's the beast, the son of perdition, the man of sin, Daniel's little horn. His aim will be the same as the Herods, the Hamans, the Hitlers, to take over the whole world. Somehow, some way, this brilliant, this genius, this demon-possessed individual will find a way for Israel to rebuild that temple. Because her entire worship centers into that temple area. And it's going to be rebuilt. How, I don't know. How, no one knows. But it's going to be rebuilt. And it's going to be rebuilt on that spot. And Israel is going to accept this man as the Messiah. The newspapers in Israel, the newspapers in the whole world will acclaim his greatness. And Israel will think, this is he. This is the one. You will turn on CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN. You will turn on the great news networks in the United States. Uh, and this man's picture will come flooding through the television screens for the nation to see. He will sign peace treaty after peace treaty. He will solve problem after problem. And yet all the time getting ready for war such as the world has never known. And Israel will think he's ours. Jesus forecasted 2,000 years ago. He said, I come in my Father's name, and me you will not receive. But another will come in his name, and him you will receive. And then, he will throw off the cloak. He's ready. The mightiest war machine the world has ever known is oiled and ready to roll. The hundreds of billions of dollars spent on armaments is now ready. He's going to take the whole world, but there is a burning hatred in his heart. First of all, he will polish off this, this insect, this, this, this people that most of the world hates, Israel. And he will invade Israel, and for the first time since 48, 56 war, Yom Kippur war, and down the line, Israel never been defeated, never stopped. She will be defeated. What America will be doing in that hour, no one knows, but the world is heading toward it. That's the reason I spoke a moment ago, America, don't let go of Israel, because in that hour, Israel will be attacked and Israel will be defeated. By the tens of thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, they will flee, they will run, they will scream, they will hide. And the world will look on and most will applaud and the nations and the capitals will say we are rid of these for good. You know why the world hates the Jew? You know why the world hates the Christian? You know why this conflict between Christianity and communism? You know why all the geopolitical global conflict? You know why? Maybe the world doesn't know, but I know and you know. It's because of one man, and that man's name is Jesus. 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 Most of the world hates the United States of America, and the United States does not know why we are hated. I sat in a restaurant in Athens, Greece, and a girl got so angry at me because I spoke of the United States of America, and her education had been provided by American tax dollars, our dollars, given to her, brought here, educated in the finest universities, but with clenched teeth she cursed this nation and said I hate America most of the world does we don't know why I know why it's because on our coins are the words in God we trust that's it that's it 
The world hates the Jew because of that one man, Jesus Christ. The scepter shall not depart from Jacob until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. It's an ironical twist. It's an enigma, a riddle wrapped in a mystery. Israel hates Jesus and the world hates Israel because of Jesus. And America supports Israel because of the one Israel hates, Jesus. Mister, you can't get away from him. You can fill your veins with alcohol. You can run. You can blaspheme him and profane his name. But you can't get away from Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus. Our only hope is Jesus Christ. Israel will stagger. And the Antichrist with television cameras all over the world recording the scene, the moment it takes place, he will stand in his supreme glory. The communist world will no doubt applaud the world of Islam will no doubt scream its approval. The capitals of the world will shout their acclaim. As television cameras record the act when he marches into that temple. Temple built to worship God. And he will pollute it and curse God. You see, the nations of the world are by and large controlled by fallen angels and demon spirits. You hear me? That's a reason for the suffering. That's a reason for the hunger. That's a reason for the starvation. That's a reason for the war. That's a reason for the agony. That's a reason for the sickness, the pain. It's because the nations of the world are, are held in bondage by satanic darkness, religious darkness. Are you listening to me? Do you understand? God's about to bring it to an end. The day of nations vying for supremacy is about over. The days of the Herods, the Hamans, the Hitlers, the Castros are about over. You'd better strut your stuff now, Mr. Castro, because it's about ready to end. And the world will watch a spectacle that most of the world will, will laugh in sardonic glee. Israel is running. And he would swallow them up. But God stops him. And his attention is diverted. Daniel eleven forty four says tidings out of the east and the north trouble him. And he goes to take care of those situations. And Israel filters back into Jerusalem. But wait a minute, we're coming to the final solution. Adolf Eichmann coined the word, the final solution. Himmler. The final solution. Goose-stepping Adolf Hitler. The final solution. Gas him to death. Buchenwald, Treblinka, Auschwitz. And now, the pit of hell marches its spirits rank upon rank to march with the man of sin. It's time to do what Egypt failed to do, what Assyria failed to do in Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome, the final solution. Tens of millions of human beings 
The ground shakes and rumbles as the mightiest tank armies the world ever knew. The skies blackened with airplanes. I stood at Megiddo the other day and looked at, at Israeli F, American made F 15 Eagles. Practice dogfights above Megiddo. The most powerful military machine in the skies, the Eagle. I watched the F 14 Tomcat. As the contrails were left and the ground shook, as the world's best fighter pilots pushed those American-made instruments of destruction to their limits. Megiddo. There's no one that knows if anyone will help Israel or not. Zechariah prophesied over 2,500 years ago, it seems from Zechariah's prophecies that in that hour no nation will come to Israel's aid. It seems like all nations will come to aid and abet the Antichrist. The world's mightiest army, the scenes are riveted in every living room, in every home in the world that has a television set. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. I have seen F-4 phantoms screeching, breaking the sound barrier at seven, eight hundred miles an hour, four and five feet above the Dead Sea. I have stood beside Israeli tanks with snouts pointing toward Syrian forces. The only touch of war I've ever known is where those people as we were allowed to go to the front lines in the last conflict they know how to fight they're geniuses the smarts that God gave Abraham is in their brains and the might of the world is coming against them but they can't take it it's like, it's like the whole land, Ezekiel says, the whole land of Israel is covered. Every mountain, every valley, hundreds of thousands, millions of troops of the Libyans will be there, the Germans will be there, the Russians will be there, uh, nation after nation, the Chinese were there, hoarding millions will be there at the, at the valley of Megiddo, at, at covering all the hills of Israel to completely annihilate Israel. The newspapers will scream it. The television cameras will record it. It'll come into your living rooms and they will announce it. Half of Jerusalem has fallen. It seems like the sky is blackened. It seems like that, that the whole world is erupting. The mightiest weapons known to man. Millions are dying. The blood runs in the street of Jerusalem. And once again, it's become the city of the damned. In the last conflict, other than peace for Galilee, Israel was running out of shells. Egypt was pushing. Frantic phone calls to the United States. The president said, get those shells there immediately. And American C-5As built in Georgia, the biggest airplane in the world. Bell is pregnant with ammunition, set on the runways, gorged, engines running. And the commandant, when told to take those planes off, the only airplane that could fly nonstop with that load to Israel. He said, I'll not 
take it off until I get a command from the president. And Henry Kissinger said, if those airplanes aren't rolling in five minutes, you'll be a buck private in two. And they rolled. They came that close. But no doubt the phones will scream and no doubt the cables will fly and no doubt the conversations will beg for help. But there'll be no help. There'll be no help. The Antichrist is rolling. The beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, Daniel's little horn. It looks like this is it. He is going to exact the last drop of blood. Israel will die. Armageddon. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. When David, ben, just before David Ben Gurion died, he was asked, what is Israel's hope? David Ben Gurion said, Israel's hope is the coming of the Messiah. Before Golda Meir died, Golda Meir was asked, what is Israel's hope? Golda Meir said, the coming of the Messiah. When Monoghan Begin resigned, he was asked, what is Israel's hope? He said, Israel's only hope is the coming of the Messiah. And in that hour, they are going to realize uh, the mighty monolith the United States cannot or will not help, whatever the case may be. They are on their own this time. Uh, their ingenuity has run out. Uh, their brilliance has run out. Uh, their back is to the wall. There's nowhere to go. And all of hell with 4,000 years of fury is rolling down and Satan is cranking up the engine to full speed. When that little people, two-thirds of them dead, Zechariah said two-thirds of them are dead and their blood is on the sand and their bodies are torn to pieces and it looks like the final solution. But for the first time, what's left is going to cry. And this time, instead of looking toward America, they're going to look toward heaven. It's coming, mister. It's coming, mister. They're going to cry for the Messiah to come. They're going to cry for the branch to come. They're going to cry for the vine to come. They're going to cry for the fourth man to come. They're going to cry for the lion of the tribe of Judah to come. For the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley and the bride and the morning star. They're going to cry for the one that has healing in his wings coming back as a man of war. And as it's fed into English and French and Japanese and Italian and Russian and every language on the face of the earth, that Axis forces are advancing on all fronts. Half of Jerusalem has fallen. There's no way out. On the valley of Megiddo, on the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of Jezreel, Announcers standing on the field of conflict in front of television cameras with a microphone in their hand just like I'm holding here tonight. All of a sudden is going to interrupt their commentary. People are going to stop what they're doing and look at the sets. They're going to turn up the volume. Everything's going to get quiet in a thousand million homes all over this world. Announcers for CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, and networks all over the world are going to start saying something is happening. Something is happening, ladies and gentlemen. We can't quite tell what it is, but in the heavens, something is coming. Something is coming. What in the world is it? You can see it. The cameras are pointed up, people strain, they stand up on their feet, they look at the screens of TV sets, uh, and announcers stand speechless, not knowing what it is. Uh, they say, ladies and gentlemen, it's so big, it cannot be an air armada. It's so large, it's filling the heavens, uh, rank upon rank, uh, tier upon tier, cordon upon cordon, uh, army upon army. Look, wait a minute, the one that's in the lead, uh, I've never seen anybody like him. The one that's in the lead, uh, I've never seen anybody.
anybody like him the one that's in the lead he's shining as the brightness of the sun it seems like a million rays are bursting upon his brow he's coming and he's got the biggest army the world has ever known and every blood 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 washed child of God is going to be with him hallelujah glory 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 to God glory to God he's coming it's Daniel's it's the Hebrew children's fourth man it's Daniel's angel it's shallow it's the one that's coming with healing in his wing glory to God hallelujah I keep telling you people we're not serving a tiny Tim Jesus I keep telling you people he's not sick I keep telling you people heaven's not on welfare I keep telling you people it's not on Medicare I keep telling you that Jesus is alive and well I keep telling you he's not in that grave his body hasn't gone back to the dust of the earth but he went away and those angels said he's coming back he's coming back he's coming back Glory to God. And you know who's going to be with him? David's going to be with him. David, the sweet singer of Israel, the one that wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He's going to be with him. Ezekiel's going to be with him. Ezekiel that said he's a wheel in the middle of the wheel, he's going to be with him. Glory. Abraham, the friend of God, is going to be with him. Isaac's going to be with him. Jacob is going to be with him. Joseph is going to be with him. The Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to be with him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Peter, Paul, Silas, James, John, Timothy are going to be with him. Every saint of God whose blood spilled upon the floors of Roman arenas are going to be with him. Because Rome, they are not dead. They are alive. And they're with Jesus getting ready to come back right now. Glory. Old John on the Isle of Patmos said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Some of you poor little old puny Christians that say, I don't believe the power of God works today like it used to. <laughs> Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. He's coming. Somewhere in that pack, somewhere in that crowd, Somewhere in that glorious, glorious army, I'm going to be there. You're going to be there. They're going to be there. They're going to be there with white robes, riding white horses, coming back, coming back, coming back. For Jesus said, not the demons, not the devils, not hell, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Poor, pitiful, pathetic. Pathetic Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> you believe that preacher? Man, that's out of Star Wars. <laughs> Mister, that's the reason Star Wars don't interest me. We've got something a whole lot better than Star Wars. <laughs> oh, glory. Hallelujah. A whole lot better than Star Wars. A, a whole lot better than Galactica. A whole lot better than science fiction. I'm so happy that I might get emotional. Some of you running around acting like you don't know how it's going to come out. Some of you acting like you don't know what's going to happen. Well, I've taken the time. I've read the last page in the book. We win. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. What a thought. Jesus, full salvation brought victory. Yes, victory. Let the powers of hell 
shall assail. Heaven's grace can never fail. It's victory, yes, victory. Everybody that's been bought and washed with the blood is going to be in that number. Angels. Angels are going to start throwing thunderbolts now. Yeah, now listen to the old clock. Stay there. Don't move. Only, it took only one angel to stop 185,000 Syrians. Only one. And he probably didn't work overtime. Glory. And the Bible said blood's going to flow to the horse's bridles. He's going to do it right, friend. Antichrist is going to be killed. <laughs> Gabriel's going to say to Michael, probably. <laughs> is he going yonder? Get him. Who is it? It's that one I've had more trouble with than I've had with anybody else. His name is Lucifer, Satan, the evil one. Get him, Michael. Get him, Gabriel. <laughs> Glory to God. Lay a chain upon him and bind him up because we're going to get rid of him once and for all. Glory to the Lamb. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, I'm happy. Yes, I'm thrilled because there is hope for this world. There is a future, and that future is in Jesus Christ. He's coming back to take possession of this planet called Earth. It's His. He's got a title deed to it. It belongs to Him. Glory to his name. He's not coming back to have his hair and beard pulled out and his spikes put in his hands and a lictor's lash across his back. A spit of bone, cursed, ostracized, caricatured, lampooned, and lambasted. But he's coming back, crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to touch down on old Olivet. Mormons are building a church on top of Mount Olivet. It's going to be busted all to pieces. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 He's coming to take charge. He's coming to take charge. He's coming to take charge. He's going to have on his general's uniform. He's going to have a sword in his hand. He's going to have on the power of war. CBS, NBC, ABC, I hope some of you are listening so you can get in practice. And he's going to set his feet on Olivet and it's going to split. And then Israel. It's been a long road, Israel. It's been a long road. It's been a lot of blood, a lot of toil, a lot of tears. But one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And the land shall mourn every family apart because they will know he was the one. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. 
And the Jews will be saved as in a day, and they will probably sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And there will be a new kingdom set up. And there will be no more crying in the ghettos. And there will be no more bloated, swollen stomachs. And there will be no more little kids that will starve to death. And we'll lay down our sword and sheep down by the riverside. And we'll study war no more. And the lion will lay down by the lamb and the beast of the wild will be led by a little child. Hallelujah. 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 Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, open the door wide tonight. Open it wide. There is a fountain opened in the house of David. Help them to come in. Lord, here in America, give us revival. Don't let us lose our way. We are a needy people. We have strayed and drifted from Thee. Bring us home. Bring us home. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I have tried in my limited way to give you a short picture of the coming future according to the Word of God. Great days are ahead for those that know their God. And I want to tell you, friend, the other side of that coin, storm clouds are billowing black on the horizon, thunderbolts of judgment appealing across the heavens. God saying to the nations of the world, I'm about to take charge, boys. There's not a lot of time left. You better hurry. You better come in, but I believe millions are coming in. I believe they're going to come in from every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. I believe the old and the young, the rich, the poor, the great, the small, the brown, the black, the white, the yellow, the red, they're coming in. I believe it. I believe millions behind iron curtain walls are coming to Jesus. I believe that millions of my precious Catholic brothers and sisters are coming to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because I believe he's told me they are. How many in this room, thousands of people here, you would lift a hand, Jimmy Swaggart. In my heart, I know things are winding up. I sense it. Doesn't take a genius to figure it out. And I want to be on the winning team. And I'm going to go for the gold. How many in this building, you're not saved? Let me tell you, you'd better get up with Jesus. You'd better quit delaying and you'd better quit slamming the door in his face. Time is running out. This is it. How many on this main floor will lift a hand? Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not living right. I'm going wrong. I know what you're saying is true. I believe it. I don't understand it all, but I believe it and I need God and I need prayer. How many will lift that hand quickly? There's a hand, there's a hand, there's a hand, there's another, 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 all across the main floor, young and old alike, raise them. On my right hand side in the bleachers, how many will raise your hands? I need Jesus. Raise it high. Pray for me, Jimmy Swaggart. I'm not living right. Pray for me. I need prayer. How many more? Come on now. 
all the way around. Thank you. Keep raising them. Keep raising them. Way in the back. Way in the back. Top to the bottom. Raise them, please. I need prayer. I'm not going to take a chance on a tomorrow that may never come. Hold up those hands, please. Left hand side. Slip it up. Slip it up. Thank you so much. I see them. Thank you. Thank you. I want everyone standing, please. I need every Christian praying. There are some of you people in this place that know how to touch God. I need your faith. I need your intercession. I need for you to believe God with me tonight. Just a moment, I want us to pray that mighty conviction will sweep this audience. Mighty Holy Ghost conviction will sweep all over this place. Join hands with that neighbor beside you and believe with me for a moment, will you? God, I'm asking that mighty convicting power of the Holy Spirit will sweep into every heart as only you can do. Oh God, that you will impress upon that man, woman, boy, and girl that God's their only hope. Jesus is their only answer. That mighty convicting power of the Spirit will touch that husband, that wife, that son, that daughter, that brother, that sister. Now, I want everyone that raised your hand and said, I need God. Listen, neighbor, time's running out. We're on the last page of the book. You hear me? The last page of the book. It's almost over. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. You're not looking at a paid preacher. I know what I'm talking about. I want you to come. I want you to run if you have to. Because the storm's coming. A storm is coming. A storm is coming. And I want you to hurry. I want you to come to the cross, to Jesus, as they sing it. Everyone had raised their hands. Come on right now. There's room, room at the cross. Room at the cross. That's it. Step on out right this moment, please. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Hurry. Storm yes, is coming. Jesus is calling. He loves you so much. Come from the top, the sides, the preachers. Come from the bottom, the front, the back. Come. There's room at the cross for you. Yes, there's room at the cross. I want you to look at Brother Swaggart, please, for a moment. You watching by television, please listen attentively. This is the moment that you've been waiting for for a long, long time. Jesus is going to change your life. What I've told you tonight is just a tiny, tiny bit of what really is going to happen. Man's only hope is to get into the ark of safety, is to catch a hold of the hand of Jesus, spiritually speaking. Now God loves you. To the devil, you're nothing. He wants to destroy you, but to God, you're special. He wants to write your name down in the Lamb's book of life, to give you eternal life. How do I get it? How do I get it? You get it by accepting Him. Nothing you can do. If you walked up here and gave me a million dollars, it wouldn't add that to your getting saved. Now, do you understand that? If you walked out of here saying, I'll dedicate my life to building schools for you, Brother Swaggart, all over the world to help these hungry kids, that'll be great, but it would not add that to your salvation. You understand that? 
Well, what do I do? Only one thing. Accept him. Accept him. Well, what do I do after I accept him? Only one thing you can do is just say, thank you. That's it. Thank you. You furnish the sinner. He furnishes the Savior. You see, he died for you. He shed his blood. He signed the note. <laughs> Glory. All you got to do is pick it up, walk up to the bank of life, and lay it down, and every debt will be paid. Paid in full. Some, maybe some of you here, I know some of you, but television said, Jimmy Swaggart, you don't know how I've lived. You don't know the things I've done. I know, but God does. But you see, he's not going to try to patch you up. Wouldn't help much. He's going to make you anew. He called it born again. The old person won't live there anymore. You're going to change. Now let us pray. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. It's, I have a lot of people write me and say, Brother Swaggart, send me a copy of that prayer. It wouldn't help you if I did. Because you don't get saved praying this prayer. You get saved accepting him. But I do this to help you to understand and to be led to him. And if you'll believe it, the moment you're through, you'll be saved. Now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? And let's pray. Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven I'm a lost sinner. I'm a lost sinner. I need help. I need help. I cannot save myself. I cannot save myself. I need you. I need you. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. And with your shed blood. And with your shed blood. Cleanse me of every stain of sin. Cleanse me of every stain of sin. Wash me. Wash me. Of all iniquity. Of all iniquity. According to your holy word. According to your holy word. Romans chapter 10. With my, mouth, With my mouth, I confess, I confess Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. In my heart, In my heart I, believe I believe that God raised Jesus, God raised Jesus from, the from the dead, and He's alive. And, he's alive. and the, same power the same power that raised Him, raised him will, change me. will change me. I accept, I accept Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ, the King of glory, as my Savior, right now, every sin is gone. I'm washed clean. I'm sanctified, justified, washed. Right now, I am saved. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah.